How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here with your 2024 NDC schedule. We'll be at as many NDC conferences as possible this year, and you should consider attending no matter what. NDC Oslo is happening June 10th through the 14th. Get your tickets at ndcoslo.com. The Copenhagen Developers Festival happens August 26th through the 30th. Early bird discount ends April 26th. Tickets at cphdevfest.com. NDC Porto is happening October 14th through the 18th. The early bird discount ends June 14th. Tickets at ndcporto.com. And we'll see you there, we hope. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. And uh, man, next week we're going to be at Build. Yes, we will. Yeah. Actually, I think this show comes out while we're at Build. Oh, okay. So, so but, we're at know, Build now. Time shifting is hard. Yeah. <laughs> How's your Build going? Oh, uh, it's great. Gosh, I loved. I had we were, no problems with travel. Yeah. Recording amazing the shows. Beautiful. Yeah. Everything's fine. And <laughs> <laughs> and while we're here at Build next week, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to be interviewing Scott Hanselman for our 1900th episode right can you believe it what could go wrong <laughs> uh it's gonna be awesome it's gonna be like the last one with sean wilderme three old white guys trying to talk about code who knows well he's a vp now so you know conversation will be a little different well he's got you know get off my lawn stories i'm sure so we're no. probably gonna hear no. some. No. oh yeah maybe, maybe a few <laughs> <laughs> all right well anyway let's get right into a better no framework <laughs> What do you got? Well, if you remember the comment you read last week, he, the, the the person commenting used the word gubbins. Gubbins. First time I heard gubbins was interviewing John Skeet yes. for DNR TV. And it turns out a tweet by Skeet is my better know framework today. Awesome. So he says, I've been bitten by the Raspberry Pi bug now. Uh oh. The photo below is an X Touch Mini which is a Behringer mixer, USB mixer. It's about right. 100 bucks, With a Raspberry Pi 02W hacked into the case. Oh, man. He opened the case and he put this little thing inside, just supply power, and it controls whatever digital mixer is configured and over Wi-Fi. No separate device required. So he has basically modified this thing and given it some smarts, and he put in to it uh, an app that he wrote called Digimixer onto the Raspberry Pi. So if you look in the links, so we have a link to his post. That's the better know framework, Mm -hmm. uh, 1899.pwop.me. And then we also have a link to the Behringer Z-Touch, 99 bucks. And that has a USB interface that he's now just looping into the Raspberry Pi that's in the case. He's powering the Raspberry Pi with that. And the Raspberry Pi if you look at the link on Ra- on Amazon, it's 20 bucks. Yeah. And it's a little board. Those little Pi Zeros. Yeah. Yeah. They're impressive. I haven't done anything with Raspberry Pi in a long time. And wow, they're getting powerful and small. They got a lot of horsepower. Yeah. I, I run a pair of them as my uh, Pi Holes, as my uh, DNS sync for all things add. It just sounds wrong. But it's, let me tell you, like, it's one thing to run an ad blocker on your browser. Yeah. It's another thing to run a pie hole in your house. Because that means that the stuff that my television gets, gets blocked, you know, all that stuff gets blocked automatically. Like, you have so much more control over what data is going out from your home. This is really um, a circling back to the very first interview i did with you richard campbell on mm. dot net rocks show 69 before you were co-host mm-hmm. and you were talking uh, we were talking about the tivo mm. and you say yeah tivo doesn't work in replay tv canada because yeah. we don't get metadata up here yeah and apparently that's still a problem well no nah. i mean what yeah so what did i do i ran a, I ran an instance of linux as a dns server to lie to the replay tv <laughs> to to run my loader of 
te- of metadata so that I had replay DB populated with the right stuff because awesome. it was just a digital recorder. But you know, this is the joys of being a programmer for yourself. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Well, I need. Oh, that doesn't work. Let me write a, in a little app for that. I'll just make a thing with the stuff and then we're done. Make a right. thing with this stuff and you're done. I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you another story just as, as an aside before we get into this. Because, uh, of course, now that we've moved up to the coast, I'm moving like all of my services. So I met my new optometrist this week. Okay. And I'm chatting with the front d- desk lady, the, the, the lady that actually runs the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we ended up in a conversation about her husband's hearing problems hmm. and how he's he's on the list for a cochlear implant which you know takes a little time to get the surgery yeah. done so like that's this is not hearing aid bad this no. is you cannot hear you cannot hear and i showed her live transcribe on android because she just didn't know wow right it's like right now she's like i'm frustrated trying to talk to him because i have to shout at him and it says well that automatically changes your mood and mm. you know you're frustrated and i literally just fired it up on the phone and put it in front of her and we start kept talking like look down everything we're saying is there like let me put yeah. this on your phone when you go home tonight right just put it in front of them and start talking and see if you right. don't figure it out right away that's so cool so i got a call from her yesterday it's like you've changed everything that is awesome i'm also really aware like cochlear implants are only so good like their expectations for what an implant's going to be are you know and you, you, just, you see a path ahead of someone where it's going to be months of sadness mm. it's like yeah. look there are other ways to address this yeah like if there's anything we've got going for us living in this technology world it's take that knowledge to folks who, who don't have it you're so right she owned the phone she didn't know the product existed yeah and it's free yeah amazing that's a great story richard yeah well, anyway, that's our Better Know Framework. Who's talking to us today, Mr. Campbell? Grab the comment of show 1892, the one we did with Michelle Duke. You know, my, once was Michelle Mannering, but then, you know, got married, changed her name, all that good stuff. Yep. Who works for GitHub. And we talked about GitHub Copilot, which we'd done before with her. So it was fun to mm-hmm. get an update on that. And Joshua Hillerup, who's been on the show as well, you know, guest and regular commenter, said, I'm with Richard on the future of AI. I can't say what will happen hundreds of years from now in this space, but I think we... Before we would get a business person giving all the requirements to an AI system generated program, we would get AI largely replacing that business person instead. Mm. Good line. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, let's be clear. How much time do you spend getting business requirements from a, from a, yeah. from a domain expert? Like it takes a right. while. So that's not a trivial thing. But yeah, there's many changes coming to space. And I know we're going to talk to Aaron today, and he's certainly working with companies that have a role to play in mm. generative AI. So that uh, I thought I'd grab that little story and think, you know, you know, don't don't uh, don't take the obvious answers here. Every time we have a new automated uh, automation tool in our industry uh, or in any industry, that industry evolves Mm -hmm. and generally results in more work, not less work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joshua, I know you already have a copy of Music to Code by, but I wrote the comment anyway because I really appreciate your insights. And you can reach out to me anytime if you like it. If you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at donnetrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and read it in the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. And you can follow us on Twitter or X or Y or Z or whatever the hell it is today. But uh, the cool kids are hanging out in Mastodon. I'm uh, Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. Aaron Erickson. The last time he was here was 2009. Uh, oh, he leads a team building autonomous agents at NVIDIA. Maybe mm. a little company you might have heard of. Uh, as I said, his first book, Nomadic Developer, dropped in 2009. And that's the last time we talked to him. Mm. And since then, he spent nine years at ThoughtWorks, moved to San Francisco, built internal developer platforms at Salesforce, became a VPE at New Relic, then lost his mind and decided to become a startup founder. <laughs> where he attempted, to San Francisco. <laughs> where he attempted to, I just want to know where mushrooms involved. Uh, no. Uh, Can't be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he attempted to build a company there at the startup that used AI to automate your company reorg. Wow. After that startup didn't work, he joined NVIDIA, where he now builds AI agents that optimize the usage of GPU resources across the GPU fleet for NVIDIA. So basically, he's a slacker. Mm, yeah, just laying around. Just doing. No wonder we haven't talked to him in 15 years. He didn't have anything. He wasn't doing anything. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> what kind of bio is that? How are yeah. you doing, Aaron? And welcome back. I feel fantastic. I mean, you know, what kind of life, charmed life do you live where you fail at a startup and they say, hey, why don't you, why don't you just do even crazier stuff with AI <laughs> than automating reorgs, um, which yeah. already sounds, I don't know, a little bit audacious, you could say. <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice word. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, dude. That seems like I mean, we already have a problem with too much remoteness as it is, right? Like nobody wants to be laid off by text message. It's just the phrase that gives me chills. I'm sure we could humanize it. It's certainly the biggest problem I have with reorgs is often people don't go through all of the steps to take care of folks properly. Mm. And so if I had a digital checklist that's making sure I'm doing the right things, maybe I can actually do it better. But you, mm. that's a tough elevator pitch. It is. Yeah. The thought anyway. was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so funny enough, you know, where we landed with this. Um, so we were working on a problem, which was, I think, a little bit more virtuous when we started, which was how do we help engineering leaders um, reorganize their teams in a better way, um, right. in a way that kind of has multidisciplinary teams. I think it started out that way. And then, as what happened to a lot of startups in 2023 or late 2022, ChatGPT comes out and everybody's like, well, how the hell do I raise another round? Mm. And how do I like, if I don't have this, yeah. How do I, how do I plant dot AI at the end of whatever I'm doing yep. and make it moderately relevant? And so our dumb idea was, well, we already have this engine that allows you to kind of do your, you know, change your organization mm -hmm. in a draft mode and then have your friends approve it or in your org and then go and do it. Why don't we just put a, a chat T wrapper around it and say, we're going to write that reorg email that everybody hates writing. Yeah. It already sounds robotic. I mean, who has ever gotten an email from HR mm -hmm. that didn't look like it came from chat GPT in the first place? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly infused with HR legalese. Yes. Oh, yeah. And double speak. I, I mean, it, to, to me, it's the classical case. I mean, there's a lot of things you do not want generative AI to do. You know, I look yeah. at the music that, you know, Carl, that you're into, and I look at a lot of really creative pursuits. And I think creativity is going to be, you know, despite all the noise, right? Yeah. It's going to be one of the last vestiges where generative AI is really useful. Um, robotic things from HR, I think it is extraordinarily useful in that. Because mm -hmm. at least we can get rid of the pretense that anybody yeah, sure. really cares about that communication, right? Because mostly they care about it for risk management. They don't like, how do we make it sound as anodyne yeah. as possible? That, that's the whole yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Um, so why not? How can we soften the blow? Yep. Yeah. Well, and not expose ourselves to legal issues. Right. You know, I mean, I, therein lies the bigger thing. Like I know, I know folks in HR who are remarkably compassionate people. They're just not allowed to be most of the time because mm -hmm. you slam right. into labor laws hmm. and, uh, and anything you say can be used. You know, you, you're almost automatically living in Miranda rights land just by, talking about HR related issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I used to do this thing at conferences where I'd say I'd write the memo, but then you could put it at the end and write it in the form of a Homerian epic or sometimes a limerick. <laughs> yes. And you have been let go, but you know it's, what? It, it, it's kind of dumb, but it was like, I would yeah. really appreciate that if I was being let go to actually read it, you know, in iambic pentameter, for example, there you go. Rhyming couplets, you know, it, at least it would make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, man. Hey, I mean, it's kind of crazy that it's been 15 years since Nomadic Developer. I huh? I mean, spending nine years at ThoughtWorks, is that really nomading? You kind of put down roots. <laughs> I mean, except for the fact that you're going from company to company to company. Right. and Just suppose, with yeah. a banner over your head. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and my personal stuff. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was I, I went from engineer to a bunch of other roles. I, you know, I think it was like, Hey, be a product manager, be a this, be a that. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, well, decide what you want to do for a living, maybe. Uh, no, you know, decide, no, are you nah. an engineer? Are you not? I'm still thinking about it. I don't know about you, Richard. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That's exactly. not a thing. Uh, but it, again, it's still is the nomading mindset, the idea of what's always the next thing. And, you know, what most people just say was a managed, well-managed career. You kind of put the nomad spin on at least that part of it. I, I think a lot of it for me, and a lot of it, despite the randomness of it was intentional. Um, and it was intentional because I wanted to, you know, if you want to be, you know, somebody leading something, I think it's good to know a little bit of sales. It's good to know a little bit of product. It makes you a better engineer. 
Mm-hmm. If you know a little bit of product, you know a little bit of the why. Why are we building this? Who does it matter to? Have you done customer research? You know, mm-hmm. you become a better engineer if you ride along. Totally. Right? So, something we did at Strange Loop, we started rotating devs into Strange Loop, we were building network appliances. And so it turned out that the linchpin of the whole company were our installers, our system integrators. Hmm. Because you're touching, you're getting in, you're putting stuff into people's networks. Everybody's network has some ugliness. It's just a question of where you know where it is. Right. And the mm-hmm. SIs, and they are all geniuses, like just brilliant, brilliant people, inevitably had to fix something in their network to have the appliance work. Like it was just mm-hmm. not, there was never not that. And when we started sticking devs with them, the, you, you do a, th- a six week rotation with the SIs as a dev. Just be on the call, see some of the things. Every single time they came back, they're like, holy man, those guys' job is hard. Mm. And our product got better for it every time because they just saw how do I provide visibility to the behavior? How do I show you know this kind of flow? How do you how do I give them switches to turn features off and on quickly so yeah. that they can figure out what's going on with that customer? Um it's this cross discipline thing is it's insanely valuable. I think you need a certain amount of depth to pull it off. But boy, I don't know how you become good without doing it. Yeah, I mean, there, I mean there's lots of people good at their niche. I wouldn't, you know, mm-hmm. downplay the person that's been doing engineering in a very specific thing in a very specific way. There's very good people doing that. But I but I would say if you aspire to run a company someday or if you aspire to be a really truly great engineering leader, having those perspectives will will be a leg up uh on average. Is the way I would say mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and every time you can get a chance to dip into the other spaces, see how decisions are made, learn that language, you know, like how those folks speak and think just makes you more capable to helping more people and to being better at your own job. Yeah. I find it really interesting that you went to NVIDIA. I mean, NVIDIA makes the infrastructure that makes AI possible. Uh, and obviously you can see the success of NVIDIA by looking at their stock price over the last few years. It has gone through the roof. The trillion dollar club. Oh my God. And uh, so what I'm really interested in is, you know, where NVIDIA lies in the software side of AI, which is what you're doing there. How does that happen? Well, the, the real advantage of NVIDIA is in fact software. It's not just hardware. Right. Um, CUDA is the moat or one of the main moats of why NVIDIA is successful. It's kind of like how Windows helped make Microsoft successful because they had yeah. backwards compatibility for many years. Well, it turns out if you wrote your software for CUDA in 2007, it still yeah. works on every NVIDIA device you buy, on every NVIDIA GPU. So explain CUDA for those who don't know. Mm-hmm. CUDA is a, it, it's the low level API layer that allows you to write code in C. Right. Or, and there's Python libraries that do it too. But if you need to write soft, it's basically kind of like the uh, assembly layer plus the C layer mm-hmm. for every GPU. If you're trying to, if you're trying to do multi parallel processing of, you know, primarily graphics, that's why it's called a GPU. Right. But it turned out, and, and this is almost kind of, they put it out there and, and Jensen Wong, our CEO, tells the story a lot better than I could possibly tell it. But you think about how AI researchers found out, it also seems to be seems to do matrix multiplication very, very well, very well which is yeah. core to how generative AI works and most AI works in general. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, it turns out that that was in, in, the, in the sense of accelerated computing, which is what we talk about now, which AI is one type of accelerated computing. Right. Uh, we don't have Moore's law anymore quite the same way we did. Right. Sure. You yeah. know, it's, I mean, it's leveled off. The, the new Moore's law, I mean, it's, it's this kind of massive rise of the ability for multiple parallelism for sure. a great, you know, scale to accelerate computing. So that's kind of the story uh, of how a 30 year company that kind of, you know, most companies don't become $2 trillion companies no. in their 30th year. They become that no. maybe in their 10th year. And it's it just wasn't gaming. This- <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I remember I have a friend uh, who's one of those low level developer types who's moved from job to job, staying in that. that and one of the gigs he did uh, was in the middle aughts and he was working for uh, an astronomical society and he was building software to utilize GPUs to do analytics for identifying mm-hmm. asteroids. So you're, you're literally mm-hmm. looking at two pictures and saying what moved kind of thing, right? It's complicated stuff. And he was hand coding all that stuff because Andrew's that kind of guy and CUDA came out 
And he literally spent a weekend re-implemented with using CUDA and went, I, I've been wasting my time. This is just true. And, and we're talking the V1 stuff of CUDA. Like, yeah, it's not like they were thinking about generative AI in 2007. That's not what they were thinking about, right? I, it's just astonishing. It's astonishing to think that that library has continued to evolve to become one of the great underpinnings of this multi-parallel uh, processing space we're now running in uh, as hardware people. Well, I, I remember talking to Steve Sanderson in at NDC in 2013, I think, about. Um, uh, his project using WebGL to take advantage of GPU processing inside a browser mm. in 2013, right? Yeah, that's the yeah. Uh, HTML5 revolution, right? The canvas yeah. compute and all of that sort of thing. I, I, I've i certainly been banging on the drum about Moore's Law ending for some time now. It was mm -hmm. uh, TMSC talking about the three nanometer process, like, Folks, you're running out of atoms. You just <laughs> cannot get much smaller than that, right? The center uh, will not hold. Well, and and also that now we're it's not just that we went parallel, it's that we're also doing specialized compute. Mm. So I mean, for long we you know, go back a few years and we had math coprocessors for our CPUs. Mm -hmm. Uh and then but when you move up the stack, obviously the GPU was the first real alternative to the CPU for major workloads. Now they're talking about NPUs, right? This sort of neural processing unit. Although I personally don't, I mean, I haven't dug far enough into this to say, how different is an NPU from a GPU, really? I think if you really kind of break it down, there's going to be a lot of different kinds of, we'll just call it asterisk PU, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, as we've gotten more advanced in technology, I mean, I don't know if it's widely known, but we use a lot of AI to develop chips. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. um, itself. Right. And, and a lot of that's going to come up with lots of different designs. Like if you can imagine if you can compile your program down to something that actually runs on hardware where, you know, your normal instruction set is XOR and, you know, you know your normal kind of assembly language instructions you might have learned early in your career. What if it's the software, right? What if you had a special chip for every kind of little bit of software that you were going to run, be it generative AI, be it whatever kind of future architecture around neural processing or other things um, because the cost to build specialized chips is going down as well. Right. So, so much so there's like, a, I think in New York, there's a, there's a, you know, somebody has like a food cart, but instead of a food cart, it will make a die. You can actually literally change the software on the die and make it build mm. like a string copy function that runs purely in hardware or something. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I like going out for chips, but this is a different kind of chip. Do not dip oh, this one in mayonnaise. On. That is wrong. <laughs> My um, first album with my brother, Franklin Brothers, 1999, we uh, programmed, I mostly me, programmed drums, you know, drum samples and stuff for all the drums. And we gave him album credits, Chip Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had a third brother. I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, depends on your definition of, yeah. of brother, I guess. You know, if you count AI, you know, it's, it's maybe a family member, I guess, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's a little wild. Certainly, I mean, I I think GitHub nailed it with the term copilot. Just like mm. it, it's an assistant, right? It's an automation tool. You're still the pilot. It's your fault when things and, go wrong. And now copilot has become a buzzword for any kind of AI. I've stopped trying to drink every time they say it because I yeah. I'm out of the keynote in five minutes, right? Like yep. you're done. I have a provocative question. Then. Yeah. What if you become the copilot? Mm. Yeah, I don't think it's all that provocative because I haven't I haven't seen a piece of software that can that has direction yet. Yeah, but you know, so like a lot of the things that we're doing now these days are. So I have a project. So we talked about autonomous observability agents. We want to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go there. there. Sure, all let's right. do it. All right, what 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 does that do? Um, because a lot of people are like, that sounds like a cool title. What does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, one of the things we discovered um, in so in my day job, which is we do GPU allocation. So we got to figure out all the internal, external groups that are going to use GPUs and take the scarce resource and allocate them in a manner that is not just good for NVIDIA, but good for our customer base, all that stuff, right? All the good things. Um, it turns out we have more data sources than we can possibly just kind of automatically do engineer or like you know, human do data engineering to understand as quickly mm -hmm. as we need to. And so it came to us, what if we built a system that could do text where you can say words in human, in English or whatever, you know, human language you want, 
mm-hmm. convert that into either you know Druid SQL or <laughs> Elasticsearch queries or any other thing, right? So we're not trying to be dev and software developer per se. We're not trying to write and try our programs. It turns out AI is extraordinarily good at writing short programs that follow well-known patterns. And, and there's a lot of training data on how to write SQL in the corpus of models today. And you can do a little bit of tuning to make it write you know, code that runs against REST endpoints, code that runs against well-known things like Elasticsearch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we have, in fact, you know, Jensen talked about it in his latest keynote, um, doing text to ABAP and SAP. So if you want to just ask questions of your database, ask questions of your you know, large ERP system, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Being able to do that, what if I can ask questions about my GPU telemetry? Mm-hmm. What if I can get answers back about my GPU telemetry? Wouldn't it be great? And I, I had this, the story I can tell is, you know, one of my frustrations when I was, you know, VP of engineering at New Relic was I'd be asked to do things like, hey, what happened with that incident last night? Mm, right. Yep. A lot of times it wouldn't be as accurate as I would like because I had to go at 8 a.m. I had to call up a bunch of directors and ask, hey, what happened last night? <laughs> and they're tired, right? They're, they're, they're exhausted. They've they already been, spent the night fighting the fire. They spent the night yeah. fighting the fire, right? And so... You, you know, you think about AIs that hallucinate. Well, nobody hallucinates like somebody that's not gotten very much sleep, right? So, <laughs> so you you have this dynamic, and so I walk into these meetings half the time, right? Half the time, completely off base. What I wanted was a system where I can ask questions: "What the f happened last night?" Right. You can add out the f if you want. No, um, no, I don't think so. And then I get an answer back, and I can then say, "Oh, great." That took three seconds, or that even took 30 seconds because it thought a lot about the question. Right. We allowed it to ruminate a little bit and confer with other experts in the system about right. the answer. And then, I don't know, give me a considered answer and then be able to help me ask the next question. You see this in perplexity today, by the way. You mm-hmm. see in perplexity, you have this capability where you ask a question and it gives you the next five good questions as a consequence of that. Mm-hmm. I want that against observability back then, if I could go back in time. Right. So I could spend that two hours interrogating the system rather than waiting for everybody to call with bad information. Right. I mean, I mean, part of me wonders, you know, is in my my time in that role is like you had a root cause analysis problem. These folks were fighting the fire and they weren't getting to the summary phase before you needed to talk to leadership about it. Yeah. Like you need you needed to finish root cause analysis and you didn't have time or, or you know, there needed to be more automation around it. Like, yeah, the number of times that uh, the IRC log for Strange Loop saved my bacon, you know that the you know the firefight actually happened over IRC because we were all mm. remote, and that mm-hmm. you could you want to know what happened? Yeah. Read it, mm. read yeah. how we spent four hours getting to knowing what went wrong and fifteen yeah. minutes fixing it. That in back of the day that I would the first thing I would do when I wake up every morning was look at the back scroll. In yeah. Slack, um, yeah. one of many incident management rooms, and you would get some you'd get some ideas about it, but it still wasn't like great. Sometimes you didn't resolve to root cause; you just resolved no. to how do we fix a thing. In fact, most no, you of the got time, to back up again, and then you went to bed. Yeah, you didn't actually get yeah. to root cause. But and I think these Gen AI tools are really good at summarizing those long logs. Like that seems to be one of the strengths they're at. Although I would also argue it's very hard to test if they're bad at it. Yeah. Like you, you ask it to summarize 40 pages uh, of notes and it gives you a paragraph back. How do you know if it's a good paragraph or a bad paragraph? Hmm. Good point. Right. Because you didn't read the 40 pages. That was the point. So how would you know if it was bad? And it, to me, the biggest battle I have with all of the neural net stuff right now is testability. How do you know it's correct? Right. Or what to what degree it is correct? Well, uh, this is called to build a robust eval set. Yes. Um, in any of these models that you're doing, um, be it uh, and, and all the big generative AI companies, I mean, they, there's leaderboards like how much they test, you know, work in the eval. Um, this gets really tricky, and this is very a very new area, right? Because I think there's maybe a small number of people in the world right now that are even attempting to do text to SQL or text to other computer language, where you're having to do the same thing summarization, but to, instead of doing kind of traditional rag or having it in the model, you're pulling new data in every time, right? Right. You're asking what happened last night from systems of record that would be able to tell you from the telemetry what's actually happening. And so it's, um, 
it's a new area. We're, we're developing it as we go. But a lot of what we do, a lot of our work in our team is less programming, more finding a good eval set and validating. Right. So we have confidence in the systems that are telling us what we think is happening. I th- and I think that's one of the things that folks are really struggling with as, from the development perspective is recognizing how data driven all this actually is. That a good eval set is a set of data you can test effectively against. Uh, without, without that, no amount of code is going to save you. Yeah. And uh, gentlemen, I need to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey, hey, hey. Talking to our friend Aaron Erickson, who has been nomading and has found himself landed at NVIDIA, which is very cool, dude. Like, congratulations. Yeah. What an amazing company. Uh, and it was it was cool before Gen AI took off and you had to run the whole place. But why are you folks building autonomous agents? Like, aren't you happy selling shovels during the gold rush? <laughs> because... The- because we can no, um, <laughs> we, we so we have a we have a need to increase utilization of our GPU fleet. Mm-hmm. We have a need to be able to monitor our own GPU environment. The reason I got started doing this is because we had a need in that category, and it right. turned out, you know, if you work for an AI company and you find AI to be useful in solving a problem, you should probably do that. Mm-hmm. And so we are doing that. Well, and I mean, you, you, you had, you, before the break, you had a little lead in. It's like, what if you were, what if you were the co-pilot? Like to me, the autonomous agent is still the co-pilot. It's just got a better instruction set. It's not, it's not a gopher. You know, it's not ask a question, get a response, ask a question, get a response. It's more of a, here's a problem space I need you to work on, report back routinely. Like it's a, yeah. it's a, almost a, if you were equating it to a junior employee and I loathe to do that because I do everything I can to avoid anthropomorphizing software uh, now that it's become a real problem. That's the only way we can think of it though. Yeah. Except that it it's makes us think thing. wrong, right? Like yeah. it makes us think, it makes us think that this thing has intent. It mm. gives, we, we, as soon as you give it an, an agency, yeah. then it's, uh, then its response has credibility more than it deserves like you but do you think that us being the co-pilot means the ai is driving the 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 train well isn't that the implication that's the idea so and you and you assist the ai when it needs help from somebody when it doesn't have the answer is that what you're talking about correct correct so what you do and i i stated this publicly you create an org structure of agents so there is a director agent. The director agent has a goal. It has a goal of a metric, almost like giving it an OKR in an organization structure. And its job is to analyze data, work with analyst agents that might understand a domain, might be, I understand GPUs need to run in this temperature range. I understand financial transactions need to operate in a certain manner. You know, you can apply this to a lot of different domains. And this is a pattern. I'm not really talking about anything secret here. Um, and then you have worker agents. Their job is to take human language and convert it into database queries or rest calls or whatever else. So it can, they can confer with themselves, right? Maybe human assisted, it might call you back, say, can you clarify this? Yes or no. Is this true? Right. It might actually ask you questions and then figure out an action plan as a result of the analysis. And so the action plan might be reallocate these GPUs from here to here. It might be, Hey, human, go take a look at this data. Tell me what you think of it, right? There's all sorts of ways you can think about this. But what it starts to do is once you reach a certain threshold of capability, it becomes more of it's driving thing. It's driving the details and you're kind of monitoring it, right? With the real data about how is this actually improving the system? Now, you've given it a mission, right? You've given it a mission. And mm-hmm. and it's attempt it's essentially going down the checklist of the right way to execute on that mission and responding to the impetuses that it gets back to it from it. And I would hope you said monitoring is the key, right? I mean, there's got to be a CEO that's watching it and not allowing it to make decisions until they're uh, understood and passed off by a human. I hope. Hmm. So, have you been to San Francisco lately? <laughs> no, but I suspect you have. <laughs> so I have an app on my phone. I can call a Waymo self-driving car right. with no driver in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it occasionally if it gets into a jam, it will notify 
somebody at a real, real human, Hey, I'm in a traffic jam or I'm stuck in some unusual condition and they take over. Yes. Somebody put a traffic cone on my hood. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And so if you've seen these videos, I'm sure you probably have not everybody has. I mean, there's people that have never seen this and haven't heard this is actually happening, but it's this kind of scaling of self-driving cars. Like we started out with cruise control. We moved to Mm -hmm. smarter cruise control. We moved to kind of, but full self-driving is like the biggest manifestation of this. But there's this kind of phase shift that happens between, hey, it helps me till now we're in San Francisco. It's I help it when it calls me. Mm. And it's just kind of an evolution of how these things happen. And so it's a lot of investment, a lot of evals, a lot of monitoring on the way there. But once you get to that threshold where you, you're you monitoring the thing and it's right 99% of the time, especially in domains where it being wrong isn't catastrophic. Like you may not do this with financial transactions tomorrow, but you might mm. do this with certain other, maybe kind of lower uh, risk sure. things. Right. And this is where it starts. And then you start to get more and more of this stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know if we're building on a house of cards here, but I certainly think that there are routine tasks in throughout business that can be operated by, from a set of rules. You know, we made fact box long ago, uh, tier one tech support, more and more automation happening on that because there is the set of, did you turn it off and on again? Did you check this? Uh, you know, the, like it's a checklist of things. As soon as you've got a person flipping through a book, you know, and going back and forth on the standard set of questions, like that could be software. It just seems like layers of automation. I just, I, I always concerns me when, when we get a sense of construing more intent than that, that it, it is still a set of instructions, although often those sets of instructions are based on a parametric response to data coming in. You know, there's a reason why we turn the we turn the lights red when it's past a certain threshold. Right, right. But there's so there's a good job or book called um, "Forgive Me." I'm going to quote a book name, mm-hmm. though it's not a curse word, but it's called "Bullshit Jobs." Um, right. Is mm-hmm. the name of the book, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it turns out there's a lot of roles that um, I think maybe aren't that intellectually challenging, but for whatever reason we still keep around where, you know, I call these kind of like low level intellectual robots. And if you can kind of automate a lot of the low level intellectual roboticness out of jobs, you think of like what happens at the DMV. I don't know that there's a lot of creativity going on at the DMV. And I don't know that you want a lot of creativity going on at the Mm. DMV. I don't know that you want a lot of creativity in your finance department in some domains. There's some kinds of software development that aren't terribly creative. I don't ever want to write another get rest point, get, you know, rest endpoint again, um, that gets data from a simple thing. I know that can be automated for the most part. And so we use Copilot for that today, right? Um, we're going to find more and more things that we just use Copilot for a lot. That's, that's low level intellectual labor. Right. Um, and we will start to automate that more. Well, and, and every, every time we've ever done this, it frees up resources for doing more creative work. Right. The, the, yeah. the reality, a lot of travel agents lost their jobs as the airline industry and the hospitality industry moved online. But travel exploded. Far more people travel. All of those industries got bigger and at net more jobs were made than were lost from travel agents. You know, that yeah. pattern consists. It happens over and over again. So the theory being the these. You know, menial jobs, these menial tasks that can be automated should be automated because that person's capable of more. Yeah. It's the only way you can look at it because you can be mad that this is happening and, and, and lots of people are. And, and I, I have a lot of, you know, but, but the reality, it's just, yeah. How, how we manage disruption is the important of this, right? Like, yeah, we should be able to manage this disruption compassionately. Right. But. It doesn't mean, you know, the alternative is not, of not having disruption isn't there. Uh, I, I referenced the, the Luddite movement. Yeah. You know, the, and if, for those who don't I mean, we've heard the term, but originally when the first automate, the first um, steam powered looms were deployed in Scotland, the folks that were used to weaving by hand freaked out and smashed them. And here's something that people don't know about that movement, but the Luddites weren't anti-technology. In fact, they were the technologists of the day. Right. They were the high-tech, they were using high-tech machinery, they understood it, but 
but it was a it was really about you know jobs right yeah and the reality of course was that was uh a communication between the employer and the employees. The result was that they ultimately rebuilt the machines and had all those people running them. Right. The bigger it thing that happened as they automated the weaving of cloth is that people bought more clothes mm-hmm. because the price of them fell dramatically. And not only that all those people keep their jobs, but a whole lot of more people got employed because they made a lot more cloth. Yeah. And you know, the, the industry exploded. The idea of, of owning different garments for every day, not just a good set of clothes and a working set of clothes came out of being able to automate cloth weaving. So you want to know one of the most ironic things about what's happening right now. I'm sure you do. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that is <laughs> nah. some of, so now engineers are automating engineering and you see this with some of the response to Devin, the software developer. I found that mm-hmm. fascinating mm-hmm. because who here in software development hasn't automated the living crap out of somebody else's jobs. A lot of other people's jobs. We've been doing sure. that That's what for I'm the saying. entire. Yeah, what do you think CI/CD pipelines are? Right. We've been doing this for the entire history of computing. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Normal. There is nobody. I'm sorry. This might make some people mad. I'm getting older, so I kind of don't care. Um, <laughs> as we all are, right? We, we all age well. But I mean. the the reality is, if you're mad that like programmers are automating programmers' jobs. Well, sorry. I, I guess that's just kind of like what we've been doing and I guess it's what coming do, back yeah. to us and it's kind of funny. But like, when people get mad at this, like they're like, oh my God, Devin, it's like, yeah, sorry. We did it yeah. to ourselves. Normal. Um, but by the way, by the way, you have so much opportunity now. Yeah. If, if, if you can learn how to construct these systems together, use this. So, you know, we, we built this thing, the, the in, NVIDIA inference microservice, which is a pattern. It doesn't have to be NVIDIA. It could be an inference microservice. So now mm-hmm. instead of building a microservice that knows one domain well and you build it in code, you build a LLM that knows one domain well that takes in requests in human and generates uh, data for you in whatever form that you need. But it's the same idea, right? And it's, it's taking some of these same architectural patterns that we've known as engineers and using it to build bigger, smarter, more interesting systems that then let us be more creative. Yeah. Why, why did you think that the methods for using machine learning tools weren't going to improve? All right. Really? Yeah. Come on. Like that's, of course they are. The, 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 especially in a young indus- in technology like this, it evolves in, even faster than the more mature technologies. Where a lot of the stuff's 1.0 and just becoming to two is a big jump. Maybe three is kind of what we're talking about. These first few versions of how we build this stuff, of course, is going to be massively transforming. Well, and, and, but but it's it's funny the way it's happened in AI, where it's kind of like it's very quiet for periods of time, right? You know, the researchers doing things. It kind of feels like it's it's quiet, it's quiet, and then boom, yeah. something like ChatGPT happens, mm. and then massive, massive change. Like, you, sure. like I think Kent Beck had a quote saying, "I don't know how this is going to change, but I know it's going to change a lot about yeah, a lot of things. How I write code yeah. and, and I think the best response to a lot of this is wonder. Yeah. You know, and, and, and just kind of being, even as you get into your later years in your career, you know, I'm kind of rounding third base in my career, I think at this point. Mm-hmm. And I, I still, every day I wake up, I'm like, what can we do with this stuff? How can we build on these, with these tools that we have yeah. to do things that are, are incredible for our customers that are incredible for uh new, like I, I look at what NVIDIA does. I'm sorry if I'm, if I sound like a fanboy, I am, <laughs> you know, guilty. It's a, it's a lot. But, <laughs> Things we're doing around protein discovery. Yeah. Things that our customers are doing around protein discovery that were never even possible pre transformers, oh. pre the transformer model. Yeah. Um, there, there's going to be diseases cured. There's going to be technologies built that make humanity better in every way possible. There's also going to be, let's be real, technologies that make things terrible in a lot of ways. And, you know, I don't, the thing is, you can't stop it though. You know, there's no world. Where you can suddenly, oh, GPUs got to throw them away. Like they're yeah. here. And even, yeah. even if technology doesn't move at all from what we have now, so we've only started to use these tools in various ways. And, and you open the door to philosophy. So let's go here. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that is always on my mind is okay, there are a lot of skilled laborers in the workforce who can make the adjustment. There are way more unskilled laborers that just need a job. And so, how do you see the future playing out for them? I wish I knew the answer to that question, but um, I don't know the answer to that question. If I'm honest, I can speculate. Mm. I can speculate that I think 
you know, the, the, the answer is sometimes everybody's going to talk about UBI. That sounds kind of terrible. Universal. Even if you have a good UBI, yeah, basic universal income. basic income, like, okay, maybe they don't do anything. I think we have to make the world more prosperous so that we can give people the opportunities to be creative. Yeah. Would be the way if, if I could be the dictator of the world, right? how I would arrange that. Um, yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. For Aaron to be the dictator of the world? Sure. Yes. That's exactly okay, what I meant, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have a better idea. Why don't we just have a super smart AI uh, be the president? I, I know it sounds a little ridiculous, but you know, so are the presidents, you know, regardless of. Uh, they so, yeah, more you know, more that's... ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, ridiculous as a service. We, we, we <laughs> admittedly are at a dark phase in, in, in some of this stuff, but I pretty sure i still want people to be the compassionate ones that mm-hmm. are helping set our values and are setting the rules for the software to, to do their things yeah <laughs> i know i'm not I'm, so, I'm such a party pooper fine <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, I can't have president gpt i mean you, you know i i i would love uh, i would love somebody to do an experiment at least uh, elect a GPT. In fact, that was one of the first things I asked uh, when Auto GPT came out, which was like one of the first agent systems that somebody built almost immediately when GPT four was live. They're like, "What if we put this in a loop?" And what if we? Mm. So I asked it, um, "How do you elect yourself mayor of San Francisco?" Because mm-hmm. you know we it, it just kind of sucks here in that manner. And it immediately knew, "Oh, I'm going to have to get a um, straw candidate because AIs can't get elected. But if I can mm. control a candidate and they just trust me with the decisions." I don't know. It still sounds dystopian. Maybe <laughs> maybe we should stop watching Black should, Mirror and being like, I wonder, this well, would be great products. Yeah, here's the real issue, Aaron, is that we decided to attach the term artificial intelligence to this technology. Yeah. Because that has had 70 years of science fiction, you know, perverting Working it, against it. You know, yep. the, ver- the first time the public hears the phrase artificial intelligence is in 2001, A Space Odyssey, mm-hmm. and Hal tries to kill everybody. Like, we have set a path, and now you want to hang that moniker on this software. Yeah, like great. It was, it's a mistake because it's hard enough to introduce new automation into society. But to introduce new automation to society with decades of telling me it's going to kill everybody, mm. like it's kind of a dumb thing to have done. I'm going to take it up with the branding department of AI and see uh, if we can come up with a better moniker. <laughs> Good but luck. Unfortunately, it. it's probably stuck. I think. I think it's once it's late. like out there, it's kind of just yeah, going to be a thing. But genie's out of the bottle. It's it's a little late now, right? But and it, and the the joke, of course, is that Minsky came up with the term to convince the U.S. Army to give him money. Hmm. It has always been a marketing term to raise money. That's the sort of reality of it. Now, every so often, you build some software, and it's happened several times. You can call them AI winters if you want, but the iteration is the same. Science works on the problem for a while till it gets to a certain level where the engineers take over and apply it, and once the applications are done, it's just software, hmm. right? Right. Are they, the joke term I've used for this has been artificial intelligence is what you call a piece of technology when it doesn't work. Right. Because as soon as it does work, <laughs> it gets software. a new name. <laughs> it becomes planning and optimization software. It becomes hmm. Vision image recognition, it becomes large language model. Right. As long as they're, you know, I do a lot of investing. If you call it AI technology, you just told me you have stuff that doesn't work. When you call it something else, then okay, let's take a look at it. The, you, that's a great point because I think a lot of people think they just got to slap an AI, you know, peanut butter on my product and it gets better. Well, I, I have a failed yeah. startup to say that does not yeah. work that way. I, and I think the best products that use AI don't mention AI at all. They just solve a problem. No, because I, I, I think it's plumbing. I think it's just going to be part of the software. The ones that do, it's questionable whether what we think of as software developers as AI were as involved at all. It's just algorithmic programming, right? I mean, there's some, they all want to slap the AI moniker on it when there may, may not be any, you know, yeah. any machine learning, any uh, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. It could it. be a series of if statements. But listen, we, without a doubt, there is a software technology using probabilistic language analytics yeah. that has getting effective results. Yeah. And it's and that's it. Right. Like now there's an interesting area to think about, about how we revise UXs 
and how we can put software in more places. Like that, this feeds into the other stories of ubiquitous computing. And, you know, we, the fact that we're making them in a small form factor, we want to put on a shirt and so forth just speaks to, I want an even more personal compute device than the slab of black glass that Apple gave me. Mm-hmm. You know, we are ripe for change in this particular space. Uh, but I think part of the problem we're having right now is this Ultron versus Jarvis kind of science fiction crap that's infected our thinking around an interesting piece of software Mm -hmm. that we can do some good with. Well, and the thing that ChatGPT nailed wasn't the fact that it's AI. Yeah, it's great. What ChatGPT nailed was what people want is I want to ask questions to a box and get moderately or ideally perfectly accurate answers to my questions, regardless of what they are. I debate the, I debate the accurate part. They wanted answers. They wanted responses that, Mm -hmm. that were spoken confidently, right? Like we're, and apparently many people are happy with the answers, even if they are not right. That was sufficient. Now, now I, when I'm doing these AI talks, I bring up AlphaFold too, because I think it's one of the most important pieces of machine learning software that almost nobody knows about. Is this the Wolfram thing? Uh, no, this is Al- AlphaFold. That comes from DeepMind. These are the guys who solved Go. Okay. But then they reapplied the technology to protein folding. And again, it's like, this is pretty esoteric stuff. But there's a few things that I find are important. Not only A, it's doing protein, it's computing protein fold results that are taking years to even validate. Like that's, so we're not even sure if it's all right, but everything that we've been able to prove so far, it's getting far better results than anything else we've ever done. Hmm. But also, like the competition, the CASP competition, which is very much like the ImageNet competition that kicked off vision recognition in the 2010s, the CASP competition has been going on for a few years. Two, what, four years ago was the first time AlphaFold jumped in on it. And they open sourced the whole freaking thing. The next two year one, it was like half AlphaFold. But this year's a, a CASP event, it's all AlphaFold. Everybody's using it. Like every scientist looked at this and said, this is a better way to work on protein problems. And they've all adopted it. Like, this is where we're seeing automation and new technology at its best. There's nobody trying to make a billion dollars off of this yet, right? When products start to appear from it, then things might get ugly. But right now in the research phase, everything has been shared. That this non-deterministic algorithm for computing behavior in, at, at the very low level of, of biology uh, is open to every scientist who's interested in this space. And they're all testing each other. They're all competing with each other to make it better. We went from media. You remember, you know, it was the XKCD where it's like identify a bird in this picture. It's like I need a huge research budget to now it's a trivial thing you can do mm-hmm. on your phone. Mm-hmm. We may be up against that for understanding the fundamentals of biology and, and complex biological organisms with AlphaFold. Like it's so profound. And it's not being, I love that it's not being celebrated in some respects mm-hmm. because it's pe- people too busy working. You know, this yeah. current detonation around LLMs is about the scientists moving on, right? The Hintons, Susquevars of the world are largely saying, hey, J- Gen AI has gone as far as it go. And that's like, okay, we figured out a concrete. Now you engineers can play with it. And we as engineers now get to change the world with it. Sam Altman, in a recent talk, I literally just listened to this morning, but it was a really good talk. Um, I think he was in MIT or something. He talks about how, great, we're going to get GPT-5, but what we want to be able to distill is the ability to figure out the reasoning part yeah. separate from the architecture that does the kind of like large language, more data. Somehow somehow we knew we added more data and we got something that uh, looks like reasoning. And we're not entirely sure it's real reasoning or, or, or what it really is. But if we start to understand the architecture of reasoning in a much more nuanced way, I think that's where the next big breakthrough is going to come from. At least that's based on my opinion today. I and mean, it could change tomorrow with whatever papers I read. Mm. But, it, it, but once we get better kind of synthetic reasoning and we understand that architecture, that's going to be probably the next. I certainly look at the smell perspective and say, are we still just making it bigger So because we, we don't actually understand it? Or I'm hoping that Jack that the GPT-5 is much more reasoned, that it's, we're not automatically bigger, that we're more focused in areas, that we're starting to do more discrimination, uh, you know, effectively understanding, uh, testing your language in deeper layers before you present it. Uh, and I don't know if we're there yet. Like it, it, 
there is a set of code smells that you see in every rapidly evolving piece of technology. And one of them is right sizing. And you are starting to see movement towards right sizing. But what you're describing then is rather than wait for the next research breakthrough from the scientists, that engineers iterate and find incremental improvements in iteration that occasionally can lead to another breakthrough. Well, and, and a lot of this, you talked about anthropomorphizing earlier in the episode. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to call out, uh, there's a great researcher, uh, Ethan Mollick, he's, uh, I think Professor Wharton or something like that. And he wrote a great book called Co-Intelligence. And he talks about actually the virtuousness of using a limited form of anthropomorphism. Yeah, I can't even say the word right, but <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. tr- you know, talking in human and, and optimizing your prompts that way. So we saw that even just asking it to think step by step, if you do a chat question and say, and think step by step, people have demonstrated to get better results. Right. Um, what I really look forward to is the application of industrial organizational psychology to using LLMs and seeing if different techniques, such as how people talk to each other, uh, how uh, organizations work and do organizations and LLMs when you have multiple agents working with each other, share some of the same properties, which on a conjecture basis, we haven't proven this, but hypothetically, they should because LLMs are trained on people and it, right. they're also trained on people's interactions. And, that, and that's the important part. It's not that speaking to it more like a human makes it more human. It's that it was trained on human data. Yeah. yeah. So right. obviously it's going to work more effectively if you work with the data set as it is. I, and, and again, I'm, I'm always balancing this what came from us uh, and is a, and it, it is the reason that things work the way they do versus imbibing any of that capability on the software itself. Hmm. It's software. It's a reflection. Which is why you always thank, this is why you always thank ChatGPT and ask, talk to it nicely because studies have shown when you ask somebody nicely for something, you get a better result than being a jerk to it. Um, and there's the most anthropomorphic. Does this mean my wife should stop telling Shalexa to shut up? <laughs> instead of saying stop she does that and i i don't think there's an llm in alexa yet so you don't have nothing to worry about <laughs> i forgot what alexa was i thought you were actually talking about a child okay now no alexa yeah no 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 i i have a i'm starting a new meme where if you put sh in front of anything that you don't like that's a, a diminutive so you no. know <laughs> This scoffy. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, plus in saying the actual word, because folks are sometimes playing this in open air, right. triggers their devices, which makes them sad. And that's been a running joke in .NET Rocks, too. So you got a lot of mileage out of that. Sounds like you're working on some amazing stuff, Aaron. I can't wait to see some of it in the field. Yeah. Like the emergence of autonomous agents. I, I hear the noise in a lot of different places. Not the product yet, but. Obviously, it's a goal. And I would categorize this show as a geek out. I mean, we really went a lot of places that wasn't real, you know, practical day-to-day programming. And it, these, these are great shows to do from time to time. So thanks, Aaron. I am so happy to be here. It's uh, It's been 15 years. I, I yeah. feel like maybe I've got a few more wrinkles. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe y'all do too. But I feel like maybe a little bit more wisdom as well. Or or maybe not. But, you know, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm excited to see y'all. It's, it's, it's great to be on the show. And... Uh, Good luck in the future, and that means everybody. And thank you for listening to .NET Rocks, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in september 2002 and make sure you check out our sponsors they keep us in business now go write some code see you next time got a transmitter band by the fcc